There we go. Okay. So now we'll have an opening prayer for Romans. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. As we uh, begin today in Romans chapter 9, um, finding there the assurance of your love and your grace um, for all of those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that that love and grace is certainly available to all. Help us as we um, study this, that you would open our minds and our hearts to the comfort that you have for us in Christ. We uh, ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going to sing Jesus, I Will Ponder Now, which is 440. 440. <laughs>
whole story there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's also one of those songs where you use all the chords. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay. This is my guitar song. challenge 101. <laughs> yes, indeedy. You got, you know, I don't think A was in there and B wasn't in there, but you did have C, D, E, F, uh, and G, and a couple of lines. That darn F. Huh? That darn F. <laughs> well, that, that was one that uh, I had to learn a long time ago because it was like, I really want to play this song, so I have to learn this chord. Yeah. So, all righty. So we are on uh, page 41, which I think, did you, you passed them out? Mm -hmm. Awesome. She said on top of things. <laughs> very good. So chapter nine, we read through it last week and discovered, oh boy, there's just all sorts of various and sundry things in here, isn't there? Um, so we're going to now take it uh, basically verse by verse. So as we get, uh, as soon as I get to Romans chapter nine. So as we get started here, Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. So let's pause for a moment here. And he's saying that he is speaking the truth in Christ. There's a couple of places maybe that connect to this. Um, in one sense, before we go to those passages, he is in effect saying as I begin to talk about my people, right, the, the, the people of my birth, right, if you will, um, I want you to know, here's the real balanced, if you will, uh, story. He's obviously writing to people in Rome. The church in Rome would have had a certain number of Jews in it. We know, we, we, we think we know from history that Peter and a, and a group of Jewish believers were in Rome for a period of time until Nero came along and started killing them all, including Peter, all right? We also know that there were a number of Gentile believers that were part of that church. So in some respects, he's kind of addressing both sides of that. And if we go all the way back to the chapter one, I am not ashamed of the power of God for salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So it's kind of like, you know, up through chapter eight, he is saying, here's God's plan of salvation for all people. Um, and now he's going to shift the focus a little bit onto his people, the Jewish people. However, He's doing that so that the Gentiles recognize the gift of faith they've been given and prayerfully that some of his people come out of their hard-hearted stubbornness and come to faith in Christ. So he's kind of still working on both sides. He's just doing it from this perspective. So basically, um, if we look at Ephesians chapter four, um, this is a section where it talks about God providing servants for the church in the form of human beings to build the church up and part of that section is verse 15 um, of chapter 4 uh, which you know goes instead speaking the truth in love we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ He's modeling this. I'm speaking this truth in Christ. In the Ephesians passage, that word love is agape. That is the underlying word. So in this sacrificial love, we talk to one another. We tell each other what is the most loving thing for them to hear, which sometimes is encouragement and sometimes is saying, my dear brother or sister, you're going the wrong direction please come back. Remember who we are as God's people, right? So it's that whole range of, it's not just God loves you and Jesus has died for you and you're saved. Yes, we do that. 
but it's also this little idea that you're following right now is leading you away from Christ, come back. It's the whole picture here, right? If we think about John 14, 6, most of us probably don't have to look that one up once you start hearing it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So ultimately, there's just some, some little ties here that kind of say, as he begins to speak this truth, it is a word that Jesus has died for you and saved you. It's also a word that says, let go of anything else that's standing in the way. And it's pointing to Christ who is the truth in a person, right? And the only way to heaven. So he kind of affirms it again. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. Um, curiously, uh, one commentator noted the fact that while the Holy Spirit shows up in Romans all over the place up to this point, in this group of chapters, 9, 10, and 11, where he's dealing with his people and how they've disconnected and how Gentiles are connected and how his people might reconnect, the, the, word, the Holy Spirit is mentioned only here. You don't find him in 10, 11, 10 or the rest of 9, 10, or 11. It's kind of like, huh, okay. Because he's working more from God's promised Messiah, right? He hasn't neglected the Holy Spirit. The Spirit just leads him down a slightly different path. Um, that, that hopefully we'll be able to follow <laughs> Okay, <laughs> in all of its twists and turns. Um, so as we think about conscience, um, it would be good just to kind of look at this from some different perspectives and recognizing this is kind of coming not only from some of Paul's other letters or even Romans is the first one, it's also coming kind of from other places in the scripture, the list could be a lot longer. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at these few. Um, so as we think about conscience, every human being has one. It is something God gifts every human being with. Every human being has some idea in their head of what's right and what's wrong. Because of sinfulness, this gets very twisted up. Right? Even in unbelievers, though, we see evidence of this. Now, in Romans chapter 2, we looked at that verse. In verse 15, all right, he's talking about unbelievers here, those who are apart from the law, those who are not Jews but are Gentiles and don't know who God is. And he says, since they show the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience is also bearing witness. And their thoughts now accusing and now even defending them. So he's in effect saying every human being also has God's law written on the inside. God has done this. So if, especially if I'm working with someone who does not know Jesus, um, there are some allies in this. Now, the chief ally is Jesus Christ, followed by the Holy Spirit, right? Because Jesus died for them and loves them and is working on them by the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. They also have the law written. And, you know, I would agree with C.S. Lewis that there is no such thing as a real moral relativist. There are people who want to say that they are. Well, you have your morals and I have my morals and they're all just morals. and They're all just okay. And you know, in this situation, it's wrong to kill someone, but in this situation, it's right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which works where there are no stops, right? So if I think it's right to just, you know, punch you in the nose as hard as I can, that's okay with you, right? No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> oh, can you get your wallet out and just hand me all your money? Because I need some right now. And I think it's morally right for me to have your money. No, I don't think there are any. And, and Romans 2.15 kind of points that out, right? Is that there's something working even in the most depraved human being. There's conscience working, right? And what Paul is saying is, I 
am speaking to you out of a clear conscience to the best of my ability as the Holy Spirit enables me, right? If we look at 1 Peter, uh, Peter kind of has the expression this way. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he's encouraging us to live godly lives primarily as a witness, right, to the people around us. So um, as we look for that verse, there we are. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. That's for us. Live such good lives among the pagans, those are people who don't know Jesus, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, you goody two-shoes, you holier than thou, yeah, it happens, right? They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Whoops. <laughs> so somewhere deep down, even in their accusations, they recognize God is living there, right? Because they're going to give glory to him on judgment day for stuff that we've done in their presence as a witness to them of God's love for them, right? So we see these biblical pieces here. Uh, Jesus had something similar to say in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. I know we're sort of going all over the place here. Um, in Matthew 5, um, in verse... 16, and this is kind of set up with you're the light of the world and all of that, which happens just before this. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So, people who don't know Jesus, if they know we're a Christ follower, at some level, may be paying attention to what we do and how we act. And when they see the evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in us and we're sharing that love of Jesus, it's all his, it's all his work, it's not mine, right? They see that and the Holy Spirit uses that as a witness to them. In one sense, as I treat people in that love of Jesus, as I stay as fully connected to Jesus as Lord and Savior as I can, it's kind of like, if you have an apple tree in your yard, you expect it to grow apples, right? If Jesus is living in my heart and I am following him, you know, as the Holy Spirit enables me, you will see that fruit of love flowing out of my life. And sometimes I'm not even aware that I'm doing it, right? It just flows naturally. So even in terms of this issue of conscience, um, there's a witness there to people who don't know Jesus, right? Now, as believers, the scripture is a little more clear in terms of the, the reality, and, and this really fits with what Paul does in 9 through 11. We need to attend to our conscience because now as we have been brought to new spiritual life in Christ, the Holy Spirit sharpens our conscience you know, not so we can look in the mirror and say, oh, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. I mean, that does happen, right? But the main reason the Holy Spirit sharpens our conscience is so that we stay deeply connected to Jesus, that we recognize I need his salvation. I need his grace. I need it every moment of every day. And in James chapter four, um, James four is kind of a curious uh, chapter because it really, um, you know, talks about earlier the big three enemies that we have, right? Um, and the big three enemies basically are our sinful self, the world around us, and Satan. And earlier in the chapter, it says, here's how you deal with that. And at the end of this chapter, um, as he gets in here in verse 13, 
Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. That's some pretty sharp words for us, right? Mm -hmm. We live knowing I live by God's grace every moment of every day. I do not know when the, last, when the next moment I will be seeing him face to face, right? You know, some people find out doctor says hey you've got this thing we can't do anything about it it's going to take your life all right so i've got a little bit of warning others none at all ultimately also in the matter of conscience if i know something is good if the holy spirit is saying do this and i don't scripture says that's sin so this is this is some pretty sharp law it's also in one sense grace that I can recognize it, right? Mm -hmm. That the Holy Spirit has opened my eyes to this. In 1 Peter um, 2, um, whoops, no, that we already did. 1 Peter 3. I'm looking at, wait a minute, we already did 1 Peter 2. What am I talking about here? In 1 Peter 3, in 13 to 17, um, we've got this kind of idea going on. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether it, it to the king as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to condemn those who do right. So ultimately, by God's will, we are to submit to the governing authorities unless they tell us to stop believing in Jesus, in which case we must respectfully decline, knowing that they may have the temporal power to hurt us in some way or even kill us, okay? But the reality is, is we are, you know, that is a witness. And even if I disagree with what my government is doing, I am to pay my taxes. I am to give them due respect. Um, fortunately, in this country, we can also say, I don't think what the government is doing is godly, right? We also have to say that kindly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something that seems to have escaped our current culture completely. Um, <laughs> so, you know, for it is God's will that in doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Ooh, there's the witness again, isn't it? I'm doing good. And it begins to act by the Holy Spirit's power as a way to silence those who are promoting evil. What version of, are you reading? I'm in the it's, NIV. It's, it's, not, NIV. it's not following. Okay, I'm in First Peter 3, 13. It's supposed to be 3. Oh, I'm not in 3. I'm in 2. That <laughs> would make a little difference. There's not that this 17. was bad. No, that no, wasn't necessarily no. bad. It kind of follows. <laughs> it's like, where well, Peter kind of repeats himself. <laughs> All right. So let's go to chapter three. Thank you very much for catching my, my uh, you know, whoopsie there. Yeah. <laughs> Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Right? That's a good question. Hey, if I'm doing good, who's going to hurt me? Unfortunately, in our world today, some people will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, but even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. All right. So ultimately, even like it works today, there are those who, if we're doing good, will hurt us. In Peter's day, the same thing was true. I would suggest between his day, the first century, and now, that has been true at one level or another throughout history, right? All the way back to Eden, likely. You know, here's Noah doing good. Who was paying attention? Nobody, right? Um, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience 
so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So it's, it's not an easy thing to lift up Jesus. There will be those who will, out of malice, even attack us. Do we see any of that going on today? You bet. And yet, as a matter of fact, there's, you know, the movement to silence any of this kind of speech by, you know, we're going to cancel you. Or we're going to publicly, you know, decry that you're uh, this or that or the other thing, none of which is true, but we don't care. Right? Is that malice? And yet we are encouraged as we have that opportunity, as people wonder to boldly speak about Jesus. Right? So let's say stand out on a street corner, be prepared to those who ask you here. Right? Um, and in verse 17, it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So we've got that whole conscious piece. Um, on the sheet, we've got um, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? So there are ways that I can look for the evidence of Christ, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that you have not failed the test, but we pray to God that you may not do wrong, not that we appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we seem to have failed. So in one sense, this is almost a Romans 7 kind of thing, right? I know the good I want to do, but I don't do it. One of the ways, though, I can look at my life is to say, where am I desire? Is my desire to follow the Lord? And I see that happening in some cases. In other cases, no, right? Um, verse eight, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. That our, 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 our conscience leads us to pray for the restoration of any we see around us who are falling away or to pray for our restoration if we sense that's happening in our life, right? And so part of it, um, I know it is, if I could go down this road, a little habit of, of Christians, including this one, to sometimes think or even say, you know, these people that just show up every once in a while, you know, I wish they would really get their act together and get here on a regular basis. Not supposed to do that. I'm failing the test. <laughs> okay. The real test is, you know, I haven't seen, you know, Susie in a while. Lord Jesus, just be with Susie. Wrap your loving arms around her and bring her back here. And if you want me to reach out to her, would you please make that clear to, you know, my poor confused mind? Right? Does that make sense? Is that a different way of approaching that? Mm -hmm. You know, that we're praying for brothers and sisters that, you know, if I notice somebody's not in church, that should be the opportunity to pray for them. Mm -hmm. And it may also be the opportunity to reach out. That that's what it means as we love each other, right? But our sinful human nature wants to go, look at me, I'm better and you're not. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of at the heart of that, isn't it? Unfortunately, you know, you, we, I hate to admit that, but there it is. Right? And that's what 2 Corinthians is kind of talking about here. Um, the leaders of the church, and, and in one sense, we'll, we'll deal with that word leader in a minute, but these passages really are more <coughs> reflective of, as, as the Apostle Paul talks about what it means to be a church leader or one that Christ is called to that position, um, he's uh, here on trial before Felix. He's talking to um, not only Felix, but um, he's talking to uh, King, uh, what's his name? I don't remember. Uh, what's that? Yeah, maybe that's who it is. It's, it's somebody there. It doesn't really matter. But basically what he's, he's kind of explaining his story, right? And presenting the gospel 
And in verse 16, he says, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Conscience clear before God, that's, that is um, one where, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And we trust that his forgiveness will work before human beings. If I have harmed someone, I seek their forgiveness. There are some human beings who are maliciously attacking me. I do not want to attack them in return. Instead, I want to pray for them and try to be a blessing to them, right? So that, that's a pretty high standard. Um, in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, we have another expression of this. There we go. And we're looking at 1 to 5. So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court indeed. I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. So he's going, as far as I know, I'm okay. Because <laughs> I work really hard at it, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that there is not sin that I cannot see. And, and so he goes on um, in that, it is the Lord who judges me. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time and wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. I just have some thoughts. You know, those in leadership, so much more is expected of them. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's why we have trouble getting, we don't want to call them volunteers. What is the new word we're supposed to say? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, people maybe think that they're not, good enough to serve in capacities or that more will, well, yes, more is expected if you volunteer for something because then you get <laughs> called for everything. But I just wonder if, you know, instead of saying, why don't these people volunteer? It's like, what can we do to lift mm -hmm. them up that they mm -hmm. either not just feel welcome, but feel worthy? Does that make yeah. sense to me? Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, I I do stuff in my own head about qualifications. Yeah. And right. Well, and I, I think part of it is as, as we approach that, um, th there are two or three pieces there. I, you know, one piece is that, we, you know, a lot of times we approach volunteers as, hey, we've got this job to be done. Uh, can you come do this job? And we don't take the step back and say, why the job? Because in the why is the joy. Here is this service that is needed so that God's people can be served in this way. And as that happens, there's joy, not only for those who are served, but for the one who serves. So sometimes, um, in the way we present things, right? We, we have to touch on that. Well, and I think that's what Julie's gonna do with her ministry minute is basically, you know, go out and-, and Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah, I'm talking about funeral dinners where, you know, yeah. it truly is a ministry and thank you, you bet. to those people that have, that have you bet. You know, spent time and effort to do that what a blessing it is to the family, but at the same time, what a blessing it's been for those of us that have been yeah. able to be together right. and, and spend time together too. Because you have that fellowship in preparing it. You also see that at this time, when people are dealing with, you know, a, a loss that pretty much disrupts everything, mm -hmm they can enjoy some time by just coming in and enjoying some food together, right? How often in the scriptures does eating together equal yeah. loving relationships every time, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And so part of it is, 
It's not just about the food. It's about the loving relationships that can happen because people are sitting there around the food, right? And so painting that picture, I think that's a, a piece, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think a second piece is this idea that as God's people, we are called to serve him, right? And the reason he does that is not only to accomplish those things he desires, but he has poured these gifts and abilities into us. He's poured his love into us. And as we use these gifts and abilities in his love in this way, we discover his joy. But as a people, this is who we are. The other piece that needs to be mentioned there in terms of qualifications is God, you know, I've heard this said, and I, I believe it is to be true. Um, God does not necessarily, um, you know, call the qualified. He equips the called. And yes, there is a risk in putting my toe in the water and finding out, you know, is it hot or cold? I don't know, right? There's a risk in that, but there's also a blessing in realizing, wow, I can do this. All right. And there's also a sadness when you realize you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that with Bible or uh, Sunday school, and my kids were little. Sure, I have kids, yeah. right, so I can do this. Uh, <laughs> that would be negative. <laughs> it was a total disaster. <laughs> there's a song by Laura Story that's Hello Unknown, and she's letting go of control and stepping out and just doing. And I told Cherish recently, and I'm like, that's my life the last few years, that yes, I do have to, to a point, say, okay, no, I can't do that, or I can't do that. But still with that, a lot of it has just been, all right, you got this. Mm -hmm. And you being God, and just saying, okay, I can, you know, bumble through it if I have to. But yeah. then I grow in him at the same time as growing. So. That's part of the process. And I think we need to communicate that to people that you may try something and you may discover a couple of things. All right. All at the same time. You may discover, I'm not very good at this, but maybe I could be. And there's some joy in that. You may discover this is definitely not where God is calling me to serve. And in some ways, that can also be, thank you, Jesus. Where do you want me instead? Right? Okay. Don't look at, we don't look at that negatively. We look at that as, okay, well, I know that there was a need here and I kind of stepped in, but I discovered I'm not really very good at this. And it does not appear to me to bring any joy. It brings more anxiety than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is kind of a sign that, Lord, am I, maybe I'm not ready for this yet, or maybe I'm just not built for this. Mm -hmm. In which case, where do I step in, right? And as a ministry, we have to foster that idea. I think that's why... You know, this idea that, you know what, I can come in and try something. And if I discover this is just not a good fit, then there needs to be a way for me to graciously step out and not feel like I'm letting everybody down. Right. That's right. A key thing too. Um, and, and because part of it is in so many places, we're so desperate for living, breathing bodies. <laughs> oh, thank you that you're here. And then it's yeah. like, oh, no, I'm in it forever. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know? um, yeah. It, it, and that, that, that's one of the ways we need to grow as a ministry. We just need to do it. I think it starts, though, with sharing the fact that there's joy in this. And that, that joy comes from being part of building God's kingdom. That it's a bigger piece. Okay, and that applies to everything, everything and everything. Mm -hmm. All right, our custodians, God bless them, they do some hard work around here, mm -hmm. and these children are messy. 
Okay, I don't know what their houses look like. I just know what the classroom looks like when I'm done with them. Um, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's, it's literally, true story. When I teach Christian living, I get in the room because the room is empty a half an hour early. I get in the room a half an hour early and I literally clean every scrap of everything out of the desks. Yeah. And I walk out of the room after having seventh and eighth grade and fifth and sixth grade and there's little bits of paper and little bits of all sorts of other things all over the floor. It's like, what are they carrying it in their pockets or what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It makes me think of what just, was the character of Pete? Pig, Pigpen? Yes. Yeah. He had that class. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. That should be their class symbol. <laughs> it just, yeah, okay. Well, I don't want to go down that road too far. Um, <laughs> always has that cloud, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, 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 the reality is, is God bless them because they just come in and take care of all of that stuff. And how important is it to have an environment that's clean as we come together? Because now it's not an impediment, right? Make sense? There is no service in God's kingdom that is unnecessary. Unless, of course, we're doing something in our own idea and that God's Holy Spirit leading us. Does that make sense? So it all, and part of it is how do we begin to connect that joy to that service? And especially things like you come in, you leave the building clean, you come in the next day, and it's all got to be done again, right? It's the continuous, there's always a dirty dish, there's always a you know, piece of clothing that needs to be washed. There's always, always, you know, it's that kind of a, it's that kind of a role. And some roles are like that. Mm -hmm. And in some respects, it's like, thank you for doing what you're doing. You know, so I, I think that's part of it. I, you know, so we can begin to model that as we can in different places and begin to encourage others to think that way that, you know, there's joy in this. Come find out. Come find out. And if you discover it's just not for you, we'll find someplace else for you. Yeah, to I think one of the joy. keys to that also is you need to get to know someone so that you've got a field of people. So, hey, I need a volunteer to help with this. This would fit their personality what they can do, whether I, I, and I wouldn't really want to call it qualifications, but how we know someone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I think individually, we need to understand what our spiritual gifts are. Mm -hmm. Right. We've done spiritual gift surveys before. And yeah. I think that would be an opportunity for everybody to understand their own and figure out where they do fit in. Right. And, and but part of that is us encouraging each other too. Oh, yes. And as we get to know somebody and say, you know, I think you might be good at that. Oh, boy, I don't know if I could ever try that. You know, you really might be good at that. You know, talk to somebody who does it. You can talk to someone over here. They do it right now. You know, and just say to them, just what is it like to serve in this way? That's a, that's a cultural change. And mm -hmm. cultural change takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. But you're absolutely correct. The other piece of that is the, 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 the main time we have people gathered together is for worship, right? Worship is a poor time to build close relationships with other people. I hate to say it, but that's the reality of it, mm -hmm. right? We gather together to worship God. Now, recognize in the early church, they would gather together and do worship, but then they would stay and eat together. That was a pretty common pattern. So you would see, here is the time where we unite in our love for Jesus Christ, and here is a time where we get to know one another and invest in each other's lives, right? And so part of it is in our modern culture, we've got to figure out a way to say, how do we begin to bring back those spaces or opportunities for people to get to know each other? Because then we can say to them, I think you'd be really good at this. And I know that so-and-so over here is looking for some people to help. 
you know, would you pray about that? And I'll talk to you in a week or two. And depending on where you are, you know, I can make an introduction here if you want. You can try it. And you can even say to them, I'd just like to try this for a little bit and see if it fits. And if it doesn't fit, then you can graciously step out. If it does, you know, right? And, and that's, that is how we can work together. Always pointing back to, it leads to this. It leads to this joy here. Although right. I do think you get at worship service a basis you do. To start forming. You do. And I, I think part of it is there are some things that we could intentionally do. And we've talked about them. And at some point, we just really kind of got to sit down and go, okay, are we or aren't we? And if we are, then we have to try it for several months. And then say to people, okay, do we keep it or does it go? I mean, are you just all going to rebel on us when we mention this every time? Um, you know, and one of the little ideas is um, that we've been toying with is called 310. At the end of the service, before you gather your belongings and walk out the door, you spend three minutes to talking to people within a 10 foot circle around you, especially those you don't know. Find out what their name is. You sit in front of them or behind them every week. Find out what their name is. <laughs> okay. And it's just, let's all be embarrassed together and just do it. Okay. Yeah, I was just <laughs> so, reply, like, I've told you my name like a zillion times. <laughs> yes, so I know. <laughs> but the thing is, is then you spend, you know, 180 seconds talking to them. And it's like, here's the question for today, whatever it is, right? Or you can make up your own. But it, literally giving somebody a topic of conversation. You know, did you grow up in Kendall? Okay, that's pretty easy. Right. Um, you know, uh, what do you do or what did you do for a living? You know, there are some simple things that could be tossed in there and people will begin to figure it out from there. Right. And then what happens is, hey, I met that Martin guy and I actually remembered his name from week to week. Oh, what a concept. And so I see him as we're walking into church together and I go, hi, Martin, how are you? And now we have a brief conversation on the way. And you see how that works? So again, it's a matter of, you know, are we going to do it? If so, when are we going to pull the trigger? And are we going to then consistently every service for three months do it? Recognizing some people were like, I'm getting out of here, you know, or I'm leaving before the last hymn or whatever it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Um, but others will embrace it. No, it's not really hard. No, it isn't. To, uh, if a person is sitting in front of you in church, and uh, you, uh, even with my mind, uh, uh, we've been here, you know, before. Yeah. I have done that three times, and uh, I found Jeff Smith, who is quite younger than I am, but he and his wife have come back to church. Yeah. And so we're, we sort of, and he didn't remember me, and I said, I can't understand that, but I remember him and his yeah. grandmother, and, you know, yeah. and we talked a little bit, and he's, he's been coming back, and then there was another, there was, I did this two or three times, and um, I don't know, I guess I'm just not bashful anymore. <laughs> well, and, and part of it is teaching ourselves not to be bashful, but just to be mm -hmm. pleasantly engaging, right? And so if you do that, you know, every service for three months in a row, then you can say, okay, we're not going to announce it. Keep going. And if it starts to trail off and six months later, you do it for another couple months. But basically it's, it's, that's how we begin to create that space, right? And for some, it'll just be, oh, you know, it's too much. But many people will recognize, okay, we have an excuse to get over the embarrassment and we now have, we're now being told or encouraged to get to know one another. And after a while, you begin to generate that. Because what happens, and this is a normal human thing, what happens in congregations 
is there are people that I know pretty well and there are people that I don't know hardly at all. And so what happens when I walk out of church, I gravitate to the people that I know really well and the people that I don't know hardly at all, I kind of smile and wave and pretend they're not there. <laughs> okay, so, and that's the way it works. And so how do we model sharing that love of Jesus with one another to get through those, you know, initial uncomfortable pieces or contacts? If you will. So, okay, yikes. Well, let's at least see if we can get off of verse one. I know I made it was really a long verse. Um, <laughs> so here is Second Corinthians four one and two, and here's another one. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting the forth the truth plainly we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god we don't use underhanded things what i'm describing to you is not a manipulative thing it's an excuse for people to get to know each other right or it's a means for that to happen and we can say the reason that we're doing this is we would like to build better loving relationships here we we value the loving relationships we see at saint john we want to build more of that and here is a simple way to do that and we're just going to practice it over the next three weeks right um and see what happens and at the end of three months if you all absolutely hate it you can tell us that and we'll stop <laughs> okay or sit on this side of the church and not that <laughs> yeah. side of the church. here's the relational side here's the non-relational side <laughs> Kind of like oh man, going, yeah, going, yeah. going back to Ben and like women, <laughs> you know, well, you know, it used to be back in the day that, that men sat on one side and women sat on the right. other, you know that, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, Schools and then there were, and, and then there were the stories that, that were reputed to be true um, of congregations where in the middle of the service, everybody would get up and switch sides. Um and, and it was just confusing to a new member. And it's like, why do you do this? They go, we don't know. We just always have done it. And so started asking, you know, members, finally found someone who was old enough and had been a member long enough. Oh, before we got central heat, the pot bellied stove was over there. So halfway through, we'd switch. So the people who were too warm would go to the cold side. The people on the cold side would come to the warm side. Wow. Things happen in churches, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or if it's just a clever little story, but the reality is. I went to a church with my in-laws, and uh, the minister was standing up there looking that way. said, okay, we're all going to get up. You on this side, we're going to this side. You on this side, we're going to this side. I'll still remember you're here, but thank goodness to be in different spots different people you can talk to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that you know, I there's different ways. It just have the ushers see this. When I, yeah. when I was young though, you could almost tell. You know, you could almost tell. Yeah. Everybody had their cue. Just you bet. well recognize <laughs> you know here's another one and this is this is factual there was a point in england where the way the preacher got paid is you would the family would rent the pew every year and there were some that were worth more money than others okay um, yes oh yeah i w when we visited colonial williamsburg there was okay so all three of my children went to washington dc with the school we were at at trinity and the deal was that was always a week-long trip we left on early on a saturday morning on a red-eye flight and we got back um flying in on a saturday usually arriving you know mid-afternoon to early evening so very long trip but the teacher would rent vans. So anything we did in the city, she had this little hotel, which and it really, I don't know if it justifies the name. Um, you know, it was a place to sleep. Let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> um, that was literally a five minute walk from the Metro in Virginia. 
So anything we did in the city, you either did on Metro or by foot. The stuff we did out, we used the vans for. And part of the trip was always Colonial Williamsburg. And it depended on how we could, you know, if we could get the White House, we had to, you know, because you don't get to pick the day. You just say, we're here these days. And they would tell you this day, this time, right? Um, so if we could get a congressional tour, same kind of deal. You know, you didn't typically get to pick the day. So the schedule would shift depending on what was on it. When my daughter went on Sunday, we were at Colonial Williamsburg. Normally, if the group was on, and you know, in Washington on Sunday, we'd all get in the vans and go to the Lutheran Church over in Arlington. But we were at Colonial Williamsburg, so my daughter and I, along with the teacher, decided we were going to church because they have church at Colonial Williamsburg in the old church. And that's when you would see we're sitting in this box, and there's like names written there. <laughs> okay, this was the pew rent you know, back in the day that paid the preacher. So, yeah, it's, you know, keep a preacher these days. <laughs> you know, now in our churches, the pews in the back would be worth the most money, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then those ones where the visitors sit and they don't know where they're the, at. The, the, the poor folks would be oh, up front. Be just... um, I don't know. Oh yes. Anyway, it's just well, all these tag. all these ways that it was done. And uh, <laughs> George Mueller, if you don't know that name, um, was an English pastor. And when he and his wife got to a point where they were praying about it, and they decided that they were going to abolish pew rent in their little church, and they basically put a box out of the narthex and said, "If you are moved to support us, bring whatever the father." tells you they never told a soul what they needed they only prayed for it oh my gosh by the end of his life on prayer alone literally would have people walk into his office and say i have this huge sum of money how much do you need and his answer was invariably talk to father and do what he says by the end of his life on prayer alone he was running orphanages for over 1,100 children. They were supporting missionaries all over the place. They were supporting teaching children and adults to read in the city of Bristol, England. And according to him, there is something called the autobiography of George Mueller that he didn't write. It was his kids that took his journals and edited it down. Um, his goal was to say, I want to demonstrate to the people of God that he answers prayer. Oh and they live their whole life that way. That's huge. It is. It's amazing. There's a true story of him on an ocean crossing where he was engaged to speak in New York and the ship wasn't making good time because they were in fog. And he asked politely to see the captain and, you know, asked, you know, why, why are we making good? Well, we're in this fog, sir, and blah, 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 blah. And he says, is there a little place where we can go and pray? And they go off the bridge to a little stateroom off the bridge. And George says a simple prayer. Lord, you know, I've never been late in my whole life. If it's your will that I'm late, that's great. But I don't think that's the case. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit. And the captain says, do I need to pray? And he says, no, I've already done it. They walk out of the room. The fog is gone. He makes his appointment. But that, God poured that grace into that man to say, I do listen to an answer in prayer. I have to remind myself that every once in a while. I don't know about you, but at any rate, all sorts of little goodies here today. Um, next week, Pastor Rigdon will be here. So bring all of the hardest theological questions you can think of. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Are you uh, going to get to go see babies? Um, no, I'm going to go see mom. Um, she is living in a two-bedroom apartment currently in the assisted living wing and um, uh, in Ohio, in the Cleveland area. We knew eventually she was going to have to move to one bedroom. The plan at the facility right now is the whole wing that she's in is going to become offices. And they are in the final stages of construction on the new area where everybody's got to move to. So she's going from a two to a one. We're not exactly sure when, but we know it's soon. So my job for two and a half days is to help mom downsize. 
<laughs> story of my life yep. with her because I spent three weeks of my life trying to get him out of the house that they were in for 30 years. Um, and God took care of that too. So he'll take care of me this week, next week as well. <laughs> Find a prayer corner, right? Find a prayer corner. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just that the Lord would, um, you know, grant me wisdom and grant her patience and, and grant and both too. of us the willingness to mm -hmm. let things go that need to be let go. Because, you know, hard. I'm four hours away. My sister's two hours away. My brother lives in the city, right? And I love my brother dearly. He does a phenomenal amount of stuff for my mom, along with his daughter. His theory, though, is it's all her stuff. She should make an individual decision on every piece. And I'm going, it doesn't work that way at 86. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, about to be 87. It just She'll doesn't work it that up. way. That's right. That is mm -hmm. exactly right. And it's just like, it is hard, though. I mean, you know, what, what do we need to let go of at this point? So, you, you know, what do we need to keep? That's the big question. What is it we absolutely need to keep? And then we have to start letting some of this other stuff go because some at some point they're going to show up and move you. And, you know, my brother does work full time. So does my niece. So it's kind of like we want to take care of some of that now so that it's not as much of a problem then. Anyway, let's pray, shall we? Oh, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Good to be with you, and um, we'll make it all the way to verse two next week, I guess. Cool. It does. The pace does pick up. The calendar is not going to stand. Yeah. 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 Yeah.